Go ahead and open up that Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. By the way, those, you know, I, I, I understand the circumstances of how sometimes you forget your Bible. If that isn't the case and, and you don't have a Bible that is in either good shape or readable or whatever, you are welcome to take that one home and uh, keep it. So 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let's pray. Jesus, would you open our hearts to the ministry of your word and speak to us and direct our hearts, Lord. I know that there's uh, a lot of questions that your people have uh, about various things, and I pray that today you would speak and minister through the, the, your word and, and bring wisdom and understanding to our hearts and help us to, to grow in grace and knowledge and, 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 and peace as we learn more of who you are and what you're doing in our lives and how you desire to speak to us. Be with us, Lord, and open our hearts. Uh, awaken our hearts. Give us spiritual ears, spiritual eyes, uh, spiritual hearts to be receptive here today, Father. Minister among us. Be free to minister among us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, we're, we did the first part of uh, 2 Timothy 3 last Sunday. We went through the first several verses where the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy and, and kind of warns him about the, the character or the quality of life uh, on this earth as it's going to be prior to the coming of the Lord. And he says there's going to be some pretty perilous times in the last days and people are going to just do some crazy things. And, and it's going to, well, we talked about that last week. If you want to get a hold of that message, you can get a CD copy back in the bookstore. But um, one of the things that I wanted to make note of in, in, in the context of the fact that the last days of the last days are going to be terrible times, there's going to be a deterioration of the moral society. Gee, we're not seeing that today, are we? Um, but, but what's interesting about that is that religion is going to thrive during that period of time. And what Paul says to Timothy specifically, and we, we read this, it was verse 5 in the last uh, study we did, he said that, that there was going to be people during that time who would have a form of godliness. Okay, And what that means is there will be a form of religion. There will be, religion is going to be on this earth and it's going to be active right up until Jesus comes to take his church. And even, I think even during the tribulation period, religion is going to, Thrive. Of course, the, the, the Antichrist is going to have something to say about you know, who you worship. But the fact of the matter is, religion, and this is an interesting thing to think about, religion doesn't need God okay, to necessarily even be religion. Because you know we're already seeing in our culture today what we talked about last week or what we termed last week was kind of a salad bar approach. You know, it's a little bit of that, take this, take that, leave this, leave that. I'll take that on the side, please, and decide whether I want to use that later or whatever. And we're just kind of, the people of the world, kind of just gathering up their religious ideas, ideologies, thoughts, beliefs, and saying, you know, this is what we're going to believe because this is what makes me happy. And that is going to continue into the last days of the last days until the point where Paul says, the people living on the earth will have a form of godliness, but there will be absolutely no power in that religious system they've created for themselves. No power to change lives. No power to renew hearts. There's nothing there of any powerful value, any life-changing value value, you see. And so Paul says that, that w what's important about the kingdom of God, and you'll, you'll look at this at the end of verse 5 again with me, please. He says, the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk. You know what? That isn't the end of verse 5. I beg your pardon. I was actually thinking of something that Paul said in Corinthians. I won't make you turn there. But it's in 1 Corinthians where Paul says, the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk. It's a matter of power. Now, should it surprise us then that the religious system that man comes up with is basically the exact opposite? It's all talk and no power. Okay? So, you know, there you go. But the kingdom of God is not just us sitting around talking. Yeah, well, God this, God that. You know, and, and you ever heard somebody kind of do the God talk? When they find out that you're a Christian or you go to church or whatever, they start talking about God, but they're, you can tell they're kind of uncomfortable talking about God. So, you know, it just comes out somehow. It happens to me all the time. What do you do for a living? Oh, I, and I hate to tell people, honestly, because they put on the God thing. 
I would rather tell people, you know, well, I'm a teacher or something like that, but I'll, I'll finally I'll have to say, you know, well, I pastor a church. Oh, pastor a church. And then the God talk comes out. And, 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 but you can tell they're not really comfortable doing it, so they start using stupid statements like, you know, the big guy upstairs and, you know, dumb stuff like that, you know. And they'll talk about prayer. Yeah, I guess we'll need to be praying about that. Huh? You know, and you know that they don't pray. They're just doing the God talk thing. That's what man's kind of idea of religion is all about. It's, it's a lot of talk. But there's really no power. There's really nothing there to change a life. So you and I, it's a different situation. It's, it's power. There ought to be power. <laughs> the neat thing is, there is power to change our life. In the Word of God, in the Gospel of Jesus Christ, in the, in, the, in the Word that we study, there is power to change our lives. The question is, are we letting that power change our lives We'll talk about that here in just a little bit. But as we go on in verse 6 now, and we begin to pick up where we left off, Paul begins to speak a little bit more about this man-made religious system that is going to be left, you know, that's going to be on the earth, that lacks power, it's all talk, and it's kind of a just, you know, salad bar approach to religion. And he says, here's one of the characteristics of that. He says in verse 6, "...they are the kind who worm their way into homes..." and gain control over weak-willed women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning but never able to acknowledge the truth. This is one of the unfortunate results of man-made religious systems. Many times they're nothing more than uh, a front for somebody to advance their own sexual agenda. In other words, I'm going to create kind of a religious system where I'm in charge... And I'm going to make the rules. Oh, and by the way, the rules mean all the women love me. Right? And, and I'm going to have multiple wives and I'm going to do this and I'm going to just kind of have my way. I'm going to be free. You know what? That's ungodliness. It's base fleshly ungodliness. But it's often what happens. When a religious system is predicated upon man's ideas, man's ways, man's thoughts and so forth. And, 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 and Paul then begins to cite an example of some people who opposed Moses. Listen to this in verse 8. He says, Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so also these men oppose the truth. Men of depraved minds, who as far as the faith is concerned, are rejected. Now, you might read a verse like this and think, okay, now Janus and Jambres, I don't remember their names coming up in Scripture ever before. And you know what? They don't. But these are the names of the music, uh, musicians, excuse me, the magicians who attended Pharaoh's court when Moses went in and demanded that he let the Jews go. And you'll remember that Pharaoh responded by saying, Who is the Lord God that I should obey him? By the way, dumb thing to do. Don't do that. But anyway, so Moses starts to show him the power of God. He takes his staff, he puts it down onto the floor, and the Bible says it immediately turned into a serpent. Literally, it became a living thing. That's pretty amazing. And that's something, but it's not a big deal for the power of God to do. But you know what's interesting about it is that it says the magicians in Pharaoh's court did the same thing. They took their staffs, laid them down on the ground, and they became serpents too. That is the ability of the, the, the enemy, literally, to counterfeit the power of God. But what we're seeing here is Paul is bringing up this example of the story of Moses to show us what these men do. They oppose the truth. And how do they oppose it? Through imitation and counterfeiting the very things of God. See, the problem with understanding and seeing lies and deceptions is that many times they're wrapped in truth. In fact, you can have a deception that is 95% true, but 5% false, and that's a tough one to find. And and it's a tough one to discern. And you kind of look at it, you're like, "Mm, well, gee, but you know, and then we make justification. Yeah, but you know, but he's such a nice guy. And, and this, you know, this thing, that's absolutely true. And, and th- you know, but there's this 5% of garbage, you know, as kind of the nougat middle of the candy bar. Uh, you know, I mean, the rest of the candy bar tastes great, but you get down to that creamy nougat and it's nothing. It's, it's, it's rotten to the core. And, and, and 
It's like, wow, it looks so good from the outside. And that's one of the difficult things. When we see something that's being imitated, you know, somebody who was sitting in Pharaoh's court that day and saw Moses put his staff down and it become a snake and also saw the magicians put their staffs down and they became snakes, you know, you might have this momentary kind of confusion about, okay, now who's got the power here? Because these magicians are obviously not worshipers of the Lord God and yet they just got done doing the same thing. Thing And you know, the Bible tells us that as, as Moses continued to do things, mir- mir- miracles, that, that for a period of time at least, the magicians were able to counterfeit those miracles. Of course, there was this interesting picture when after the, the magicians caused their staffs to become snakes, it says that Moses' snake, staff, thingy, uh, gobbled up theirs, which would have been a really interesting picture. But, you know, there's kind of like a little, there's like a little message there that the Lord God of the universe, you know, He'll let the enemy counterfeit and imitate for a period of time, but ultimately He's going to be gobbled up. Ultimately, He's going to be consumed by the power of the living God. And, and, and God allowed it to happen after a period of time. Look what it goes on to say in verse 9. It says, but they will not get very far. Why? Because as in the case of those men, Janus and Jambres, their folly will be clear to everyone. How was their folly clear to everyone? Well, again, eventually the miracles they were able to counterfeit came to an end. They couldn't keep doing it. And eventually, not only did the Jewish people leave the nation of Egypt, but their entire army was destroyed in the process. And so you see the folly of these men was eventually exposed. And Paul says, it always is. It always will be. God's going to win in the end. If there's nothing else you, you know, understand from the Bible, it's God wins in the end. Okay? You know, we've got the end of the book. So he goes on here now, and he's made an example up through, you know, verse 9 here. And it's been a, kind of a negative example. And he's been saying basically that this is the kind of life that these men lead. He's been talking about the, the godless example of people in, in, in the world during the last days. Now what he's going to do with Timothy is he's going to speak to Timothy about the power of a godly example in someone's life. And here's what he says, beginning in verse 10. He says, You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, and sufferings. Let's take a look at these. First of all, he says, You know all about my teachings. Your Bible may say doctrine. And basically Paul is saying, You were there, you hear me, you heard me teach, And you know exactly what it was that I taught. There's no question in your mind what it was. And next he says, you know my way of life. You know, one of the things I love about Paul was he was so real. And he allowed people to see how he lived. You know, he wasn't one of these guys that kind of like existed in the spotlight. And then the minute the spotlight, you know, is no longer on him, he kind of creeps off into a corner somewhere or hides, but only comes out when the spotlight's back on. He lets people see his life on a regular basis. He lives his life in such a way that, you know, you can see how I treat my family. You can see how I treat my wife, not specifically referring to Paul, but any Christian leader. You can see how I'm raising my children. You can see, you can see my life. This is an important thing by example that we ought to be looking for and that we ought to be seeing in our Christian leaders. Next he says, you you can see my purpose. You know, let me tell you something. Somebody can be somebody can be a great teacher or a great preacher, but their purpose can be absolutely all wrong. And you see it eventually. I it, you turn on the television sometimes to some of those interesting channels that play religious guys during you know Sunday services and so forth. What's the number one thing most of them are talking about? Not all of them, but, but the number one thing they're asking for is money. They want money. Why are they so obsessed with money? It's like, give me a break. Chill on the money thing. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe that's their purpose. Maybe that's the whole reason that they're doing what they're doing. Maybe so. Well, you know, eventually you're going to find what someone's purpose is if you hang around them long enough. Are they there to get rich? Are they there for the glory? (laughs) You know? Are they there for the power trip? You know, I'm the leader. I told you what to do. Do it. Sort of a thing. What's going on? What's their purpose? You know, Paul said to Timothy, Tim, you know my purpose. 
You know what's going on. You know that I'm not, it's not about a power trip for me. And you know that it's not about getting rich. He says, you know, Paul was the kind of guy who refused to take money from the local church most of the time. And he got out there and worked just like everybody else. He just, he just lived like everybody else. He often went without sleep. He often went without proper clothing. He often went without food. Because you see, all those things, the comforts of life, the pleasures of life, and, and all those, that, that wasn't his purpose. His purpose was to serve the Lord. But eventually you're going to see that after a while. And that's going to be taught by example. What's the next thing he says? You've seen my faith. And that means, Timothy, you've seen my complete reliance on God. You know, that's something that really blesses me. When I see people who are just really relying on God for everything. And they pray about everything. We had a, one of the pastors on the pastor's list server this last week um, put out a prayer request. And at first, I've got to tell you, I was, I, I was kind of like, what is that? But he said, guys, I need your prayer for my laptop because my hard drive is about to die. I was like, oh, dude, just go get a hard drive, you know? But, you know, I don't even know what's going on. I don't know if you can't afford to get a hard drive or whatever the deal is. But, you know, he's saying, you know, pray for my hard drive. And I'm feeling a little bit stupid about this whole thing. You know, Lord, I just really pray for his hard drive now and pray that you'd comfort it, you know. And it, just, it just seemed a little bit tweaked to me. But, you know, when I got to think about it a little bit more, I thought, you know what, here's a guy who's... There's nothing too small for him to pray about. In other words, his relationship with the Lord is such that he allows the Lord into every aspect of his life. Everything. No matter how small, no matter how seemingly meaningless, he allows the Lord into that area of his life and says, Lord, I'm just going to give this to you too. And I'm going to pray about this too. And I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to spend money or do things or whatever without talking to you, without consulting you. I'm going to look to you. I'm going to open my heart to you. And I'm going to say, Lord, be Lord. You know, I've asked you to be Lord of my life, you know. It's, does that mean only in the big things? You know, okay, God, I'll, I'll get to talking with you, you know, when the biggies show up. Otherwise, you know, I think I got this thing dialed in myself, you know. I think I can handle this thing. I, you know, when it comes to like a hard drive, you know, or it comes to this, it comes to that. I think I can handle this on my own. Thank you, God, very much. We're a team, buddy. Here we go. You know, I mean, that's, that's pride, you know what I mean? But there's, when, when there's this attitude in people's hearts of this real, real, true, genuine reliance on the Holy Spirit that says, you know what, God, I'm going to put my faith in you for all these things. Not just the big things, but even the little things. And I'm going to start talking to you when I get up in the morning, and I'm not going to stop talking to you until I go to bed at night. And who knows, I might even talk in my sleep a little bit. Well, forget it, don't listen to that part. But, but the rest of it, you know, I just want to be in communication with you, you know. I want, to, I want to have that kind of a personal, intimate relationship with you where I'm giving you all these things, you know. Praying about all these things. He says to Timothy, you've seen my faith. And then patience. He says, Timothy, you've seen my patience. Patience is the ability to wait on the Lord even when everything around you is saying, go, do it now. Kind of like, you know, the... Um, the hard sell. You, you know, don't you, when you walk into a store or somebody comes to your door or something like that, they really, they, most of them, not all of them, but they, they want you to make a quick decision because if, they, if you can make a quick decision, uh, usually it won't be a good one. I don't know about you, but that's the way it is with me. I, I've gotten to the point where I just get in trouble if I make quick decisions. So I have to just, I have to have patience, you know, and wait on the Lord for His direction and His guidance just being patient is not easy. You guys know that. Patience, in fact, is a big fat drag most of the time. But uh, I'm learning, I'm learning that if I don't have patience, I don't make very good decisions. He says, also, Timothy, you've seen my love, my love for the Lord, my love for God's people. You've seen my endurance, my willingness to put up with circumstances that most people wouldn't put up with, you know. And he's all, he says, Timothy, you've also seen my persecutions and my sufferings. And then he specifically reminds him. Look at the, there in verse 11. He says, What kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra? The persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. Fact of the matter is, Paul uh, knew that Timothy knew about what happened to him in Lystra because that was where Timothy was raised. And that's where Paul and Timothy first met was there in Lystra in his hometown. And you know what happened to Paul during that trip to Lystra? He was taken bodily outside the city limits and a bunch of guys picked up rocks and stoned him, I think, to death. I think to death. 
But here's what happened. After, after he was lying there in no doubt a pool of blood with rocks all over him. And by the way, those guys knew how to stone people. I mean, it wasn't kind of like just, hey, this is a good idea. Here's a rock. Let's throw one at him. This was a, this was an accepted form of execution and they knew how to do it. And they, and I don't think they probably threw a rock and then ran. I think they threw a rock and they waited to see if with a job was done. You know what I mean? But it says, it says that after those guys walked away, the brothers came over to Paul and they got around him and they prayed for him. And you know what? It says he got up. That's amazing. Well, it's amazing he was even alive. Next thing amazing thing, he gets up. And you know, and then the last amazing thing of all is that he went back into the city. I think I'd have found the closest Greyhound station and, and gotten the ticket, you know, as far away as I, as I could possibly get. But Paul went back into the city and he's saying to Timothy here, Timothy, you've seen the example of how I live my life as it relates to persecutions and trials and difficulties. And one of the things I love about that, I love about the fact that Paul went back into Lystra, is I think he was making a statement himself. He was saying, I'm going to leave this town, but I'm going to leave it on the Lord's timetable, not on man's. And there's something I really like about that, not getting pushed around but saying, you know what, I'm a servant of the Lord and I'm going to do it His way and I'm going to, I'm going to live for Him, even in this. So he says, you know, you, you, you know how all th- these things happen. And then he drops this little bombshell in verse 12. He says, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. I suppose you could call this a promise in the Word of God. I don't know that it's one we'd put on a refrigerator necessarily and say, I'm just claiming that promise, (laughs) you know, that I'm going to have persecution in my life. Listen, you don't have to. It's going to come. Paul said, if you want to live a godly life, and you might say, well, what does that mean? That just means you want to live for Jesus. And and, And I trust that we've all, you know, experienced that in our lives where there's just that kind of that welling up in our hearts of love and and, and gratitude for God to the point where we just say, you know, God, I just want to live for you. I, you know, I'm tired of living for myself. I'm tired of doing my own thing. I want to just, I want to live for you. And I want to live a godly life, you know? Well, you know what? Paul says there's a promise that goes along with that desire and it's persecution. And it happens in all kinds of different ways. And I know that you experience it. Some of you may not even be aware of the fact that you experience it, but some of you are married to unbelieving, you know, husbands, wives. You have unbelieving parents who are nearby. You have unbelievers for children. You have aunts and uncles or bosses or somebody in their life that really doesn't like what you believe. And there are subtle forms of persecution that go along with that from time to time. And you experience it sometimes right there in your home. Well, don't be surprised because we're told here in the Word of God that when we want to simply follow God with all of our hearts, there's going to be persecution. But we're to rejoice in the midst of that persecution. Verse 13 says, While evil men and impostors go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. And what that means is those individuals whom we talked about earlier, not only are they going around knowingly deceiving people, in other words, they know what they're saying is a lie. They know there's no truth to it, but they're deceiving people anyway because of what they can get out of it. And then they also turn around and they themselves are deceived. It's a, it's a, it's a rotten situation. But he goes on in verse 15, or excuse me, 14, to say, but as for you. And that separates everything that we've just talked about, just with the evil men and imposters and deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, Timothy, he says, continue in what you have learned, in what you've been taught, and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it. And that again underscores the power of example. He says, Timothy, stay the course, buddy. Stay the course in what you've learned and what you've understood because you know the people's lives who taught you this stuff. You know the genuineness, the sincerity of their lives is such that you know they're not blowing smoke in your face or trying to, you know, run a quick one by you or something like that, you know these are the real deal. And you can trust their own lives because they've lived their lives as examples and so forth. 
And he says in verse 15, And how from infancy, from your very earliest days, you have known the Holy Scriptures. He talks, now he talks about the Holy Scriptures. It literally means the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation. And then I want you to notice the last part of that sentence, through faith in Christ Jesus. All right, now he's going to talk for just a minute here about the Scriptures. But I want you to notice here, he talks about the Scriptures that are able to make you wise unto salvation. But that salvation, you'll notice at the end of that verse, is through faith in Christ Jesus. You know what that tells us? It tells us knowing the Bible isn't enough. So many times people will say to me, you know, they're talking about a friend, loved one, acquaintance, whatever, and they'll say, man, he really knows the Bible. That doesn't impress me because you can know the Bible and not know God. You can literally know the Bible and not know the author. And you know, (laughs) hey, listen, Satan knows the Bible and he can quote it, but he's not saved. So knowing the Bible isn't enough. And I don't know if if you kind of had a sense in your heart like it was some kind of an academic success story where if I just learn enough about the Bible, that isn't going to cut it. You've got to know the person who wrote the Bible. And ultimately, you have to understand that in the Bible, it says that we are saved by putting our faith in Jesus Christ and what He did on the cross. That's how we're saved. We're saved by faith in Christ Jesus, not by an academic understanding of the Bible. Okay, academics doesn't cut it. It's a relationship. You know, when Jesus when Jesus separates the sheep from the goats on the last days, like he told us he would, he's going he's going to basically speak to those on his right, and he and he's going to say, you know, come, you who are blessed by my Father, and da 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 da. But he's not going to say, you know, you guys really knew your Bible, or you really knew the Bible, man. You knew it upward and backward and sideways, and I tell you, you just you studied, you did a great job. Come on in. That's not going to be the issue. The issue is going to be whether we knew Him personally. That's the issue. We know the One who is in the Scriptures. Jesus Christ Himself and have put faith in Him. And then Paul wants to say something to Timothy as a reminder. And it's important that you and I see this. In verse 16, he says, All Scripture is God-breathed. And that is literally what the Greek means. Your Bible may say inspired by God or given by inspiration of God, but the Greek literally means God-breathed. In other words, God breathed into the, the hearts and the minds of those who wrote down what they wrote down in the Word of God, and it is from Him. And then, because of that, it is therefore, look what he goes on to say in verse 16, it is useful. It's a great understatement, isn't it? The Word of God is useful, or your Bible may say profitable. Profitable for what? For teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for, and for training in righteousness. It is useful for these things. So he says in verse 17, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped, notice that, not partially, but thoroughly equipped for every good work. You know, guys, anybody, anybody can read their Bible. Anybody can merely read the Bible. But there is something that takes place in the life of a believer when rather than just reading the Bible, they open their heart to the one who authored it and they begin to ask him to speak to them through the Scripture. Suddenly, they're no longer just reading the Bible. They're reading a 66-book love letter. And they begin to find application and understanding to the things of the Word of God, and they get excited. And I can tell you something, as a pastor and as a teacher, there's nothing that gives me more pleasure than seeing the children of God opening their hearts to the love letter that is the Word of God, and they begin to bring application into it. It's just the most amazing thing in the world. And they come to me sometimes, and they say, Pastor Paul, you know, I got to show you this. And they're just pumped. And they like, come here, come here, come here, come here. And then, then they show me and they got it underlined. And look what I, look what God spoke to me. I was praying about this and I was asking God for direction. And I, and I was really just trusting that he was going to lead me. And I read this and they open up the Bible to a particular book and they say, and when I read this, the Holy Spirit just spoke to my heart and said, son, this is for you. And they're just so excited because now it's alive. 
It's personal. You know, otherwise we're just kind of sitting and reading, you know, reading the Bible. And I got to be honest with you. There's some parts of the Bible, even though I, I've taught through it now, I'm on my second time through the Word. There's some parts of the Bible I, I enjoy more teaching through it than I do actually just reading through it in a cursory way. You know, I get to part some parts of Leviticus and stuff like that, or Numbers, <laughs> and, I, and I'm kind of like, okay, looking for an application here, sort of thing, you know. And so and so was the father of so and so, and he had this many sons, and then, and I'm kind of okay. But, you know, we're reading through it because it's the Word of God and it's, you know, it's, it's in the genealogies and all that kind of stuff was important to the Jews and so forth. But, you know, when, but, but that's what the whole Bible is like to somebody who isn't opening their heart to the, to the personal message that the Holy Spirit wants to bring. And so I want to really challenge you guys and I want to encourage you that as you open up your Bible and as you begin to read, stop just reading the Bible and start listening for God. Start listening for His voice and expect that He's going to speak to you from the pages of the Word of God as you're reading the Scripture. I believe, I believe you know, we, ought to, we ought to imagine that, well, not just imagine, but we ought to have a conversation with God. I mean, you know, you pray, right? I'm assuming you guys pray from time to time. That's cool. But does God get an opportunity to talk? Or is it just kind of just you? Or are you kind of of that theological position of, well, you know, God sure had a lot of things to say back in the Old Testament. He hasn't talked for a few thousand years, though. He's got kind of this, you know, divine laryngitis thing going on. We're not really sure what's happening, but we go ahead and just talk to him and we have a good relationship. Have you ever had a good relationship that was all one-sided? Can you imagine getting on the phone with somebody and you have to carry the whole thing and all you hear on their end is just silence? Listen, God wants to talk. He's written it right down here. And you know what's interesting to me? Is I'll be reading through like Isaiah. And I, you know, I've studied through it and I know what it's about. I understand the, you know, the context and the, the historicity of the passage and how it was written and why it was written and to whom it was written. But you know what? The Holy Spirit still takes this passage out of Isaiah for, or, or something or any book and just comes along and I'm reading through it. Well, I'm not, you know, I'm just kind of reading through it. And all of a sudden the Holy Spirit speaks and says, Paul, pay attention, son. I have a message for you. You've been praying about this. You've been seeking wisdom about this. I'm going to talk to you here now and I want you to pay attention and I want you to hear me. And I tell you, that word just comes to life. And and, it was written 700 years before Christ was even born on the earth and I know to whom it was written. And, and, And still the Holy Spirit uses that word to speak to me. And it's personal. It's personal. You know? And it's exciting. Because now we're having a conversation. I'm hearing from the Lord. He's talking to me. And I'm talking to Him. And there's communication going back and forth. And it's what a relationship is supposed to be about. The Word of God is living, living, and active. And God wants it to touch our hearts again. Maybe the way it used to when we first came to know Him. God wants to speak to you again, afresh, anew. So let's start opening our Bibles and, 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 and having an expectation that when we do, He's got a message for us. Amen? Let's stand together, please. If you have a prayer need that's pressing upon your heart this morning, um, I would encourage you to find someone in the body here uh, that can pray for you. Uh, hopefully you know someone that you can just go to and just say, hey, I need, I need prayer this morning. If you don't know anybody, uh, come on up and grab me. I would love to pray with you and just agree for whatever you know, is going on in your life and, and uh, help you, you know, carry that burden to the Lord because that's where they need to go, don't they? They need to go straight to the Lord because uh, you and I can't carry those burdens. I mean, they'll destroy us, literally. They'll la- literally squash you like a bug. And if you've been feeling like the weight of the world's on your shoulders, don't leave this place today without giving those to God and remembering His promise to you that whoever is weary, whoever is heavy laden, they can come to Him whenever they want and He will give you rest. He promised He will give you rest as you take those burdens and give them to Him. You know what? Those burdens aren't going to bug Him. In fact, I believe He delights to see His children bring those burdens to Him. And just cast them off and trust Him with the outcome. So, be sure you get prayed for by somebody before you leave today. 
if there's a if there's a burden on your heart. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your goodness and grace and life and peace and truth. God, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you, Lord, for the power of that word to change our lives. And we ask you this morning in Jesus name to use that word to speak to us again. Lord, we need to hear your voice. We need You, through Your Holy Spirit, to be making that Word alive in our hearts. Do that work, Father, that only You can do and fill us with Your grace. Thank You so much, Lord. And Father, I thank You so much for mothers today on this Mother's Day, this day that we set aside. Thank You for their sacrifice and their tenderness and their instruction and their guidance, and their love. Be with each of the moms, no matter how young, no matter how old, and bless them today, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a good rest of your day.